How did you become interested in gerontology? Let's see if I can make this a short story. I was looking for a master's thesis topic and I wandered into the library and I picked up a book by Warner Shy called Cognition and Aging and I thought, never thought of this, this is really intriguing. So that captured my intellectual interest. And at the same time, my father-in-law was terminally ill with cancer in a skilled nursing facility. So I visited him every day. And although my area is not healthcare, it struck me on a personal basis, some of these issues related to aging and later life. And on the intellectual academic side, I was intrigued by this topic called aging, let alone aging and cognition. So that was an initial piece that got me to write a master's thesis on something I don't have anything to do with today, which is called remotivation therapy. So I pursued that as a thesis topic, and as a sidebar, no one at my university at that time knew anything about aging. So they said, well, there's some people at the Andrus Center at USC, they have a, you know, maybe you can go there. So someone met with me for an hour, which I thought was a gift from God. I said, yeah, your topic really makes sense. Uh, so I pursued my topic, and um, as a result, there was, at the time, the Andrus Gerontology Center ran a summer institute. Mm -hmm. And one of the women um, was conducting a course, Irene Burnside, was conducting a course called Working with Older Adults, which doesn't sound very new today, but I have to tell you, in the mid-70s, that was really very innovative. And one of the therapeutic modalities she was teaching was remotivation therapy. She said, would you come and teach a one-day course? I thought, well, this sounds interesting. I said, sure. So I taught this one-day course. Um, and there's a story to that if you're interested, a sidebar. I don't know how long a story you want. Uh, we can get back to that. But nonetheless, and then there were a couple of grants that were available that either no one had time for or no one wanted to do on mental health and aging. And they said, gee, you know, you did a pretty good job today in your, court, your class. Would you like to pick up two little mental health grants? And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I, th I think I'll do that. So I started in gerontology two days a week. That was kind of backing into the field. That's, uh, that's great. So that actually starts to describe your career trajectory a little bit, at least the beginning of it. Um, at, at what stage was it in the teaching or at later where in your career you embraced the term gerontologist to describe yourself? Well, let's talk for about the teaching piece first. Okay. I was never hired to teach. Okay? I was directing projects, executing projects. And there are certain times in one's life where a switch gets turned. So my boss at that time was Ira Hirschfield, who went on to become uh, the executive director of the Haas Family Foundation. And the woman who was heading up the retirement area was leaving, and he said, you know, Helen, you know, is this something you'd like to explore? I said, sure, but I don't know anything about it. So I proceeded to read everything I could find, attend every seminar, every workshop, and I went back to Ira, I said, you know, Ira, it's such a nice offer, but I have to tell you, this is the most boring topic I have ever encountered. And they, he said something which really turned a switch, which was, you know, maybe it's your job to make it less boring. Well, up until that point, and this could be a product of the 50s, the rigor was if you didn't like something, you either walked away or you were quiet, but the notion that you could change it never occurred to me. So I walked back, I said, you know, this is a great, this is really a great idea. And I pursued then writing and teaching and publishing and heading professional organizations that dealt with retirement. But it was that conversation that said, you know, if it's not the way you like it, change it. That was a very inspiring moment. That is inspiring to me also. Yeah. <laughs> um, the challenge to, to make something the way you want it. Well, and uh, if you to make it less boring, to make it less boring and make it relevant, and I, one of my criticisms was everyone says the same thing, and they all talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, how interesting is that? So it was uh, it was a turning point. So what else? Um, what else changed in terms of 
your career trajectory? Like, how did it progress after that? Well, so I was invited to teach, mm -hmm. and Dr. Peterson said, well, you know, why don't you just teach the course now? So, and I was never hired to teach, so why don't you teach the course? So I taught the course and ended up getting an award for you know, excellence in teaching. Um, so the teaching part was always a part, but I continued to direct projects. And then I left uh, the full-time position to become self-employed um, with no strategy. It was clear intuition. It's none of the advice you would give people who are becoming self-employed. And my exit project, which was in the 80s, was developing the first national corporate management training program that dealt with aging, with combined maybe three quarters of a million dollars disseminated to through five universities to 100 employers and demonstrating that when you include, when you talk about, then you can teach aging to managers and it can have an impact on their decisions. And we demonstrated impact, okay. That was a little before its time. And we gave the program away to 100 companies. I assure you, two years later, they probably weren't using it because it wasn't relevant. Who's worried about older workers in 1989? You know, it, it was a little before its time. But we did demonstrate that education and training can make a difference on attitudes and the decisions you make based on those attitudes towards aging. But that, I left with that and I went to the conference board in New York and did a little work for them for their corporate clients on this particular project. Mm -hmm. So people have said to me, well, that should have been your career. You have this management training program, but my spirit, if you will, is, well, we've done that. We can put it into the universe. What's the next piece? Okay. Um, and then at least I became self-employed and ended up doing a lot of retirement education on non-financial issues. Worked for a decade with PricewaterhouseCoopers, teaching with their folks to large corporate clients. And that was really taking aging into the workplace. Now we didn't talk, it said that it was aging the workplace. We gave it different names. And so I've worked with about 10,000 employees, um, including uh, not only your corporate managers and, but factory workers and clergy and railroad folks and executives and faculty and staff and a pretty broad array of, of folks. Um, and it is all in the teaching mode. Mm -hmm. So although you haven't asked this, and I'll share this with you, I see my, my core as an educator, but it takes a lot of different shapes and forms. I can go on unless you would like to ask me a question. So the question would be then, you see yourself as an educator, do you also see yourself as a gerontologist? You know, the answer is yes in terms of how I perceive myself, but the public is pretty, still pretty confused. Mm -hmm. um, some still think gerontology is a skin disease. You know? um, so I typically, depending on the audience, mm -hmm. I will say I work in the fields of aging, I have a focus on employment retirement. Um, and yes, it's the field of gerontology. Gee, is that like geriatrics? I mean, do you take care of old people who are sick? No, no, it's probably the other side. People have potential to have influence over their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's still some confusion. It's much better than 10 and 20 years ago, but it depends to whom I'm speaking. Yeah, so yeah, your audience for sure. Um, in terms of uh, the mentors, you mentioned a few people, like, um, but did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? Interestingly enough, I had no female mentors. The two mentors I had were men. Mm -hmm. uh, one was Ira Hirschfield, and the other was who was D Dr. David Peterson, who has since passed away. Um, both, and I should say a third, Dr. James Buren, because this all operated in the Andrews Gerontology Center when he was dean and director. Mm -hmm. And there was an environment of possibilities. And if you had a good rationale, some financial base to it, obviously, um, you had an opportunity. And it was extraordinary. I mean, extraordinary opportunity. So Dr. Peterson, Ira Hirschfield, mm -hmm. and Dr. Beeren created that environment where possibilities could happen, which was, what, what more could you ask for? Right. It was really an exceptional time. Um, so with that said, 
you you sort of innovated into this field, uh, like you said, uh, self-employed based on intuition, your spirit was innovation and so on. What do you think is unique about both your path to gerontology and education in gerontology and just being a woman gerontologist? You know, I've never perceived myself as a woman gerontologist. However, I know in, um, let's just take the woman part and move the gerontology aside. I think it's different now, but I have always felt there is very little margin of error. That um, not only did you have to be good, and did you want to be good, but you were excellent. You were excellent. Uh, I worked with younger male counterparts at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I often work with younger men or women. Um, and I guess I've always raised a high bar for myself. But excellence is where it has to be, otherwise you don't do it. I, I, my feeling, and this could be just my perception, that the public, the audience, the environment is less forgiving for women than for men. And maybe this is the classic minority syndrome, if you will. I don't think it's bad. Excellence is what we all should be aspiring to. But I have always sensed that if you cannot be excellent, don't do it. Um, so that's a lot of pressure, but I think it warranted. How has being a gerontologist and, and your academic and, and work practice interacted with your own personal aging experience? Um, I can tell you a new self-awareness uh, knowing the physical trajectory of aging, um, and I've always been physically active. I have been running since the mid-70s, or actually the late 70s, modest runner. Um, I've been doing yoga for years. And very recently, it dawned on me that my posture wasn't quite what it should be, and that my upper body strength was really not as good. And not that I'm tripping and falling, but I said, you know, I'm not as, am I as stable on my feet? And I hate gyms, hate gyms, but I have surrendered and I go to a fitness center that's a little different from a traditional gym. And I go to a fitness center twice a week and have a program to work on strength, posture, and balance. And it makes a difference. And as I said to the owner, I don't think I have a choice not to be here because I know I know what I'm doing is not enough, and I know the trajectory. It may not be a deep one, but it is a downward, it's just aging folks, it is a downward slope. And I feel really good about it, and I feel great. So I think if I had not been so keenly aware of the functional declines that happen eventually, mm -hmm. and that you have influence over it, you can postpone it. If I had not been so intimately aware of that, I perhaps would not be as committed to fitness. So mm -hmm. that's a personal take. So that self-awareness and understanding of the aging process you mentioned, being more aware of the physical impact, what about the other types of impacts of the aging process? Well, the for connection and well fortunately, know. fortunately, I love my work and I have work opportunities. And fortunately, I have good friends and family and colleagues uh, um, and that I'm intellectually engaged um, and socially engaged. And I do that because that's what I like, mm -hmm. but I also know that's very good to maximize functioning. Um, but I don't do it for that reason, but I know it's, a, it's a, and having a purpose, reason to get up in the morning, mm -hmm. feeling worthwhile, having an impact hopefully somewhere. That's all part of successful aging. Right. And it sounds like you're aware of it and you've covered, covered try, all the bases. Try to walk the talk. Yeah. Um, and not, you know, not to be a statistic, but for my own fulfillment. Mm. Um, so. That's great. Um, so this project um, focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Let me add another piece to okay. this. Um, um, as an educator. Mm -hmm. I also write a weekly newspaper column called Successful Aging that now reaches 1.3 million readers. I just finished my 656th column. <laughs> I keep thinking, is there more to write? And that piece is a very 
different dimension to the education because I now have a platform for 13 years, a large platform for public education. Mm -hmm. So the education is not only university and seminars and public speaking, maybe some keynotes, but now there's a public platform. And people are, ex I mean, I'm always shocked, but they're very responsive. It's a Q&A, and the column, I call it sneaky public education. Mm -hmm. It is, dear Mrs. Smith, thank you for your important question. We really understand what you're mm -hmm. saying. Now let's talk about what we know about caregiving or what we know about unemployment and age. And the core piece is always, what do we know? Either a piece of research or some experience, and then maybe how they might apply it, and then some resources. And that template has really um, resonated. As I'm always shocked when people read it, it's, and it's like teaching to an empty classroom. You prepare this, and you have no idea what happens to it. They send it to their Aunt Nellie. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're using it to move and stuff, you know, wrap their dishes in. Mm -hmm. But you, I find that these columns now have a lot. And with the internet, I now, if you know, someone wants to use it in South Africa, and I got some question from Korea. So now the platform was not just my little t right. my town or the county, but now there's this large platform. So it's, a, it's very interesting. And what it does for me, it keeps me very honest. I have a sense of what people are concerned about or where they see the opportunities. And I say, that's the ground level. So I say, that keeps me in touch with reality. A um, lot of work, paper a week, it's like being in school. But it's gratifying if it can make a difference, if people make different decisions about their life. I'm wondering, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I'm wondering if the, um, the broader audience you reach with that, is it also more diverse in terms of cultural diversity or different types of diversity, economic diversity? I think it's people, number one, who read newspapers. So that's the 50 plus. Mm -hmm. And then there's the internet folks who run the gamut. Um, I I can't tell the diversity aspect mm -hmm. because they're question, they don't write and say, I'm an African American or I'm Hispanic. Or raise specific questions. Or, but they do say, you know, I've been on, I, my husband is unemployed for X years. Mm -hmm. He's driving me crazy. <laughs> what can I do? How can I be helpful to him? Mm -hmm. Or a caregiver one. Or I went to the department store and they, wouldn't, they waited on all these young women mm -hmm. and they didn't pay attention to me. And I think it's because of my age. What do you think? So we do a little piece on age discrimination. So it, 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 it also sounds to me like it, you're, you're taking, a, when you're talking about the, the audience you're reaching, the content as well is going more from theory to the practice, exactly. how to address ageism, how to deal with it, yes. and, and taking gerontology out when they don't even know it's about gerontology. It's taking gerontology into the marketplace, yeah. to the consumers. Yeah to the consumers, yeah. which um, is an incredible opportunity. And I find they, they, want inf they want to be heard. They want information that's kind of interesting. Um, and they want to feel it applies to them. So it's a different kind of writing than academic writing uh, or uh, book writing. Uh, so it's, um, it's been gratifying. Yeah, sounds like it. That's great. Um, I'd love to see if we can get it in Canada. Get it in Canada. <laughs> we can get it online, I'm sure. Would you like to know one more piece? Sure. Okay. So um, there's another piece that actually deals with women. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1989, a colleague called me and said, is anything being done about retirement and career women? And I said, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. He said, well, are you interested? I said, I'm interested on two levels, one professionally and two me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We got together, she said, well, let's see if we have um, something to talk about. So we had a four hour lunch. And she said, well, why don't you invite some women, like-minded women, I'll invite some women, we'll get together for dinner. It was a four hour dinner. And what evolved was a monthly discussion group on issues facing career women. So, and it also, it's men also, but women seem to talk a little bit more about it. Who am I without my business card? Mm -hmm. What does productivity mean at this life stage? What if he retires first? Um, wh where is my passion? We had no intention of growing. We made up a new word called renewment, which is crossed between retirement and renewal. No intention to grow. But some other women on the west side of Los Angeles said, gee, I hear you have this interesting group. Can we, can we join? Well, 
from a group process. It's hard, hard to join in the middle of a group. We said, you know what, we'll help you start a group. Well, then other people felt, well, P.S., there are now about 30 groups that have emerged as renewment groups to talk about these transition issues. At the same time, we got a little press, didn't go after press, in the LA Times and also Time Magazine Online, and the CEO of Scribner, which is a sub of Simon & Schuster, read it, called the journalist. She said, find me these two women. I always knew there was a book in this somewhere and had a beginning of a book proposal, but I don't know if you've ever written a trade book proposal. It's a huge job. By the time you're done your proposal, you're done 80% of your book. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big job. Always on my plan B list. So she called, we'd like you to write a book. So my colleague, Bernice Brother and I said, oh, we can do this because we had transcribed the first five years of our discussion. Just knowing, not know what to do with it, but there's something going on here. So 18 months later, we turned in a manuscript called uh, Project Renewment, the first retirement model for career women. And then, to our total shock and amazement, we were on the LA Times bestseller list. So you're talking about backing into your life. Yeah. Um, and that continues. Um, we have a website. We don't market, but by word of mouth, and relevance, because now that we have more female boomers, female baby boomers retiring, that becomes a little more relevant. And the, probably the postscript is, the women who started this now were 15 years older. But the conversation continues, not necessarily about work to retirement, but life issues, legacy. Am I leading the life I want to live? Mm -hmm. What does giving back mean at our life stage? So the process has stayed the same, but the topics have been aligned with the life stage. Um, so, and we have a group of women in their 80s that started a group. We had a group of women in their 40s. So it's been a fascinating process to watch. We're not an organization, there's no money, no one wanted to be an executive mm -hmm. director. So we said, you know, let's put it into the universe. Let's see what happens. Informal. It's a viral, kind of viral kind of thing. So that's been really fun and quite interesting. It sounds like it. Yeah. I, and it sounds more like you're, instead of backing into your life, it sounds more just open and aware. Do you know what? I you think know? that's a really good point. I've, always, I've really been heading into my life yeah. because many of these issues are a little bit before their time. Exactly. So you've that, mentioned that a few times. But yeah. that's such a good point. I never thought, it's not backing in. We yeah. headed into it. Yeah. I've headed into my life. Yeah, you've just been open to opportunities and you know what it is it's the signs mm -hmm. you know as I say it's not rocket ship science but it's paying attention to what this environment and the opportunities um, hopefully to make a difference and you have clearly well we hope um, within the framework of the legacies mm -hmm. leading us into that question of older women gerontologists is there anything else that you'd like us to know about what legacy women gerontology is is leaving, or, or you specifically are leaving and want to leave? Well, if you think about messages, um, I think it's very important to be strategic, to have a good plan, but never to let that limit your view. And I think intuition is a very valuable trait. It has to be well thought out. And that individuals can make a difference. You never do it alone. You need your team. But in terms of thinking and rallying the troops, um, I think the possibilities are endless. Um, I think finding, when I say like-minded people, but diverse in thinking that will challenge your thinking, um, I think it's all there. And I just would encourage women to, for to f go forward into their career, uh, to be on the edge to try something new. And the notion of having mentors uh, is really important. I now have a reciprocal or reverse mentor relationship with a woman in her late 20s who knows a lot about social media but doesn't know anything about aging. So we have a reverse mentoring relationship. I think to be open, particularly I would say women in my life stage or closer, to be open to having relationships with younger women who know things different from us, but we need to know that, mm -hmm. and to be open to that, and to be generous. And just as a commentary, I, 
I, find, I have always found people in the field of aging very generous, share their ideas, share their resources. If someone asked me, how do you deal with a competition? I said, I might be blindsided, but I don't see it. There is so much room to do so much. And if someone steals an idea from you, that'll be the last idea that person had, and you're gonna have about 400 more ideas. Mm -hmm. So not to be too possessive, um, and to continue to be generous, to be generous with yourself. Well, one addition, this is an exploding field. Uh, this has more challenges, more opportunities than ever before. And the other thing is, everybody's getting into the field of aging. Um, you know, business is a little slow, but they're slowly recognizing that their consumer base is older. Um, I can remember years ago when the space mission failed. No, it was before the space mission failed, when he went up into space in his 80s. Um, um, John, Glenn. John Glenn, when John Glenn <laughs> went into space. NASA became gerontologists. They were intrigued, a man of his age. What happens to him physiologically? So, I mean, Everyone's getting into aging. Okay. So, I mean, gerontology is coming of age. We now have you know, new, new, new language, the third age, renewment, uh, generativity, uh, the bonus years, uh, la troisième age. Uh, at the same time, we're fishing for ways to talk about it that doesn't discourage people. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of another stage of the field. How do we talk about retirement, but it doesn't say retirement. You know, we talk about the upside of aging with Paul Irving. Um, we talk about unretirement with Chris Farrell. So we see nuances of how to discuss this threatening field, if you will, in ways that make it acceptable, um, something that you want to aspire to. And I think this is just another the po positive aging movement. Um, I think this is an evolution saying it's relevant, but now how do we make it palatable and desirable? And I think it's a stage that we're in now. We didn't write about this 20 years ago. We were looking at the declines. Now we're on core.org. We're now looking at upsides of aging. Mm -hmm. It's a new dimension. And it's catching on because it's more comfortable. People want to hear about possibilities. So now I'm giving you a whole lecture on things that you already know. No, it's, it's <laughs> interesting because the reality has changed a lot. It's sort of the opposite way instead of academics or theory sort of predicting this, it, it's almost like the terms and the theory and the academics are catching up with the reality of we're living longer, we're living better. What are we going to do with all this extra time? And, and, you know. Yeah, and I, I think your point, the academics and society are getting closer together, mm -hmm. are getting closer together. Yeah. And that's great because if it's on a bookshelf or in a report, it's not going to do anybody any good. But if we start acting on it from maybe a policy level and a practice level, and, uh, and I think that's part of my interest, is linking what we know to what we do. And I think a lot of my work has been that linkages. Um, and it's been fun. It's been great.